Chacon Pena and Ron Bermuda. This is my grandpa and I love him. Welcome to episode number two. To the life of times of Ron Bermuda. Are you eating? Ron Bermuda, born in Managua, Nicaragua in 1941, is a celebrated Latin DJ who in the 60s worked on air for Latin radio stations KBRG and Radio KOFY as a popular DJ. In the early 70s, he was a radio engineer at KSFO and for the San Francisco Giants. His diversified life took an artistic turn as a salsa dance performer and fiery instructor. It remains his passion to this day. We'd like to welcome you to episode two of the life and times of Ronald Bermudez. In light of his current health challenges, we want to celebrate his life while we still have him and share with you how he helped aspiring young musicians become better versions of themselves. workshop and so um, having said that Roberto I'll let you expand on that experience I was 18 years old and uh, I already had gone through uh, years of being trained by Cesar Chavez Dolores Huerta with the United Farm Workers was involved with the Mission Coalition organization and Ron pulled me out and said hey um, Mission District Musicians Workshop explained to me his vision, his goal, and then one thing led to another, and, and then the next thing I remember was being at his house on San Jose Avenue, and he was having house meetings, planning with a whole bunch of people who none of them had any idea of how to organize, how to plan, I'd do anything, but they all had one common thread, and that was the love for Latin music. And I think that that's what, the, what really brought Ron, and he created this synergy at the time that it really brought and started developing this unity amongst Latino, Latina, musicians, but most important, community. Because there was a lot of people who were not musicians that were part of the Mission District Musicians Workshop, but they had this passion and love for Latin music. And at that time, you know, you already had Santana and you already had Malo. I mean, it was that music was already booming. And a lot of us had were grown up with 
the cha-cha-cha and mambo because our parents listened to that kind of music. And Ron had an incredible collection of 45s and albums and 78s, actually. And I remember sitting there for hours and hours just going through all of his uh, library of music that he had in one room. And um, Ron was just an amazing... I remember he had a, a, he worked at the radio station at night, and so he had a Chronicle newspaper truck and throw us all in the back of the truck. I remember that. <laughs> and we'd bounce around, you know, and back then, I don't know how many bruises people got in that truck. But then finally, I remember one day, these guys were out here. Handing out flyers. Yeah, right? handing out flyers, you know, for, for for events that he was putting on. And then I remember at one point he landed up getting tossing me the keys and says, Hey, you, you take them on to go get my flyers. So I'm here driving this car for this paper truck. And oh my god, it was so much fun. Did he not? I just like oh, he put me in whatever environment, I'm gonna have fun, you know. And, and, and so, yeah, so it was just a really unique, special time. And then, you know, he came up with this idea of doing La Raza Rock Festival. And the next thing you know, he had booked the Cow Palace and we were all like, wow. And you know, a lot of us already had been to the Cow Palace because at that time, the Cow Palace was a musical venue. You know, I, I remember seeing uh, Tower Power, James Brown, Earth, Wind and Fire. Just a whole lot of bands, you know, at that time. And in fact, I'll tell you, there, there was uh, uh, Reverend Cecil Williams had called me because I was then, by then I was working at RAP. And uh, he said, hey, Roberto, let's do the first, you know, uh, street fair uh, of Throw World People because that was like, you know, they call it Color People of Color and they call it all the other stuff. But then it was people, uh, Throw World People. And, and the Reverend Jesus would may he rest in peace, you know, had the first street fair out in front of Vive Memorial Church. And that was amazing, you know. And the next thing I know, we got a call from, from him saying, hey, Marvin Gaye's coming to town. He's going to perform at the Cow Palace and, and uh, gave, gave, us, gave me a whole bunch of tickets. And we took a bunch of kids and, and people from the Mission, Mission, Mission Musicians Workshop you know, to go see Marvin Gaye. And we had front row seats. That so, was so what, what was the amazing. Which what included was, yourself and the, the Tablada brothers and Nancy Obregón and others. And so Nancy and Barbara and Junior and Anna and Sandra. I mean, Lexington, Lexi, the alley, Lexington alley. Sandra Cocorns. Yes, yeah, Sandra. No, there was that whole block where everybody, just about everybody on that block was part of the mission. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the Cow Palace, you know, the Cow Palace, you know, was like, I just started imagining this concert. And then Ron came up with this beautiful vision and idea to create this artwork that had this woman with long hair, beautiful Latina, and then created around this made the body of the woman, you know, um, Mexico and Central America and all of South America. It was just a beautiful artwork. And that artwork became the art piece for La Raza Rock Festival. And let me tell you, when we were putting the poster, everybody wanted that poster. When we were giving out flyers, everybody wanted that flyer. And that, that to me was like historical in nature. And in fact, years forward, I landed up asking Ron for permission to use that one year for the 24th Street Cultural Festival. Remember the 24th Street Fair? Um, and uh, we did a, a rendition of that image. But Ron was ahead of his time, you know, and as in retrospect, as I think back, right, he had the, a real clear vision, a real clear, you know, um, dream but most important, the the heart, the soul, and the spirit to really promote uh, Latin music, you know, amongst young people. Um, and I'm talking about teenagers and 
young adults, and of course, a, you know, a, 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 a adults, period. But just that, that synergy of him bringing us together and then creating these events was just so powerful and so amazing. And, and, and that's what, you know, like he was on Radio Kofi, Radio KBRG, and then after uh, he tried to get everybody unionized and he got them unionized, and Ron's payment for that was they blackballed him. He couldn't get a job because he got all the Latino DJs unionized. So he took a job down to Salinas for a while, but he applied to KSFO, and he wound up working for years as engineer for the Giants, which turned out to be a better paying gig and very rewarding, you know. But if Ron was here right now, what would you say to him about the way he led you in those days and the experience uh, and influence that you gained from, you know, mentoring under my brother and listening to his vision and goals. Well, first of all, I want to thank Ron um, for teaching me that everything that he taught me and so many of us. Uh, and it was more passion, you know, and to really believe in something. And when you believe in something, you work. You, and, 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 uh, and, and work unconditionally. And uh, I'll tell you, that's carried through through my own work, you know, Carnival. I mean, I dedicated, you know, 46 years of Carnival, seven days a week. Working 28 hours a day. Yeah, uh, you know, and that was Ron, and that was one of the things. So, I, you know, between, you know, him and Sister Charles and Dolores Huerta, I mean, the, you know, it's, I, could, I, I put him in that category because they're just so dedicated that... It's not about money, it's not about glamour, it's just about love and compassion and, and believing in something and putting your whole heart into it. You know, so I thank you, Ron, for for being a mentor and somebody that uh, at that time, without even knowing it, was, you know, a role model of somebody that was dedicated and kind and and God, he used to feed us, you know, out of his own pocket. He used to take us to Mitchell's ice cream and on hot days and go get ice cream. But you, but you know, I just want to end by saying that, you know, there's people that plant seeds in your heart, your soul, in your mind, and you don't even know it until you get much older. And Ron was one of those who planted seeds inside of me. And I appreciate that, and I honor him for that. He's, he's somebody special to me. He loves all you guys. He I, talks I, about I, you glowingly. I, you know what? And I tell you, one of the greatest things that I saw uh, Ron teach uh, dance classes, you know, and then to see him and Pepita dance together, which is like, I mean, they should have been on some national TV competition, probably would have won. But, but anyway, I, you know, just, just the him preserving our culture, that dance tradition to me was just another piece that had nothing to do with La Raza. And Juan was a, you know, an entrepreneur. I mean, he was a barber, right? You know, you know, he was probably one of the first Latino barbers. He was one of the first Latino barbers. Yeah. You know, so when you look at Ron, you know, you kind of like look at the whole, the big, the bigger picture. I've seen that, you know, and. and and, you know, and being Nicaraguense, you know, and coming here to this country and being, you know, uh, I mean, I never forgot his Spanish, would talk to you in Spanish, you know, and he would scold people, kids, his kids say, habla español es tu lengua, y no, no, no seas, he, no tengas, he made us not be scared of it. Yeah, no, no, no tengas miedo, no, you know, he said, don't be embarrassed, you know, because at the time, he, I remember, I remember going to school and being told not to speak Spanish by his teachers and the principals, you know. But he he instilled that that brownness, you know, that indigenous, that you know who we are and to be proud of who. And that we got to keep being that, yeah, no yes. matter what. You know? and, and, and that he had and, and again a big influence on my life about being proud of who I am. Yeah, thank you for always being a faithful friend and uh, always being somebody that, that, that recognizes 
all the sacrifices of my family for the community. Okay? Thank you, Roberto. So I was in college and, uh, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, getting the radio, I think, at the time. And uh, So Jorge told me, yeah, my brother's in radio. So I went over to, to KSFO, where Ron was working. And uh, I, I was in the lobby and he'd come out from his shift and he said, hey man, I'll be with you in a second, no problem. He sat down with me, he gave, he gave me his time. He was so generous and he asked me what I wanted to do in radio. He asked me, you know, do I want to go in engineering? Do I want to be, you know, behind the mic? Whatever it was, and he was just so nice, so nice to to and and here's some radio right here. And anyway, he was uh, he was just a generous person, and I really always remember that. And I appreciate that. This is a San Francisco Giants story about the Latino ball players that were on the team in the 60s. Ron Bermudez arrived from Nicaragua in 1957 at 16. By 1958, his beautician aunts had encouraged him to become a young barber. Then he got his license and he started working at the ultra-modern barber shop on 21st and Mission in San Francisco. Soon after becoming a barber, Ron also started moonlighting as a DJ at night on Spanish radio station KOFY in San Mateo. This led to a lot of promotion with dances. Salsa. Because of these dances, my brother became very good friends with the San Francisco giant Latino ball players. They all loved to dance and they were big music fans. You gotta understand, at this time in baseball history, there wasn't very many Latinos on teams. However, the San Francisco Giants had a bunch of them, and they were good. And they used to come and get their hair cut, and they knew my brother from the dances, and they would play pool a couple of doors down, and also there was a steak shop. So here I am, a nine-year-old kid, Looking at all these guys, it was like amazing. Baseball nirvana. On any given day in the barber shop, you could see Hall of Famer Juan Marichal, Orlando Cepeda, Felipe Jesus and Maria Lou, Tito Fuentes, Manny Moda, and a bunch of other guys. <laughs> it was rich. He got me a job as a rookie shoeshine boy. I did not want to let my brother down. And besides, at nine years old, I loved having my own money to spend on comic books and baseball cards. I wasn't too good at it, but I was learning to shine shoes better day by day. Dios mio! One day, I was handed the prime assignment of shining Philippe Alou's shoes by my older brother Ron and he said do a good job I tried started out doing a good job but I got mesmerized by this baseball star I got distracted oh, oh, no. No. laughter broke out in that shop everybody could see that I absentmindedly had shined his white socks brown Bendejo. Everybody was laughing at me, Dios mio, how embarrassing. Well, everybody in the barber shop might have been laughing, but my brother Ronald Bermudez was not, nor his boss, Seal. And they were both looking at me like, mm. I didn't get fired this time, but a few weeks later, my brother 
was cutting Juan Marichal's hair. Juan Marichal, the Dominican dandy, it was like Batman walked into the ultra-modern barber shop. And he was my hero. At nine years old, this was a time that I was really into superheroes. And Juan Marichal was like Batman. Because when he started a game, it was over for the other team. So, And he was Latino, brown like me, so I love the guy. I couldn't believe that I was this close to Batman, Juan Marichal. <laughs> I'm Batman. So my brother finishes cutting Juan Marichal's hair. And it's closing time, and me and my brother are going to close up the shop. So my brother goes in the bathroom, and I'm taking care of my last duty, which is to sweep all the hair up and clean up the shop and leave. Well, as I'm sweeping, I get over by the telephone, and what do I see? I see Juan Marichal's phone number. Hey! Number on the on the appointment book. What did I do? I'm nine years old. Batman's phone number. I took it, and my brother came out of the bathroom. He didn't know, and we went home. Thought about it for a few weeks. What am I gonna do? So foolishly, I decided <laughs> to give him a call one afternoon from our home in the mission and I just called him up, picked up the phone, he says, hello. I said, hi Juan, this is Jorge, the kid from the shoe shine kid from the barber shop. He says, well, I was sleeping. How did you get my phone number? And I went, well, I got it off the address book at Ultra Modern Barber Shop. Click. He lost against the Astros that night. He was the starting pitcher. I always felt responsible. Anyway, as you can imagine, I got fired. My brother Ron was so pissed off at me. But I got to talk to my hero. What do you do? I was nine years old. Anyway, go Giants. We loved you, Willie Mays. We loved you, Orlando Cepeda. Thank you for all the beautiful memories. What did you think of Willie Mays? He was the uh, our hero for the Giants for, for many years. What did you think of Orlando Cepeda? Same thing. Our hero for many years. Those two guys used to kill the hopes many things. I met Bob Rob Bermudez probably in the early 70s when he was living on San Jose Avenue. And uh, we got really close, you know, I, I was just getting going into the music business. And then we hooked up again 
in the mid 70s when I was with TNT and we did the La Rosa Rock Festival at the Cow Palace and I helped finance that and it was a really good show and you know and that's when I uh, got the opportunity the very first time to play the Cow Palace and so you know it was really good to see somebody like Ron that's been a big pillar of the Mission District for so many years and you know and now to be able to put Ron Bermudez and his daughter on the house is an honor and a blessing. That's really kind of you to say, and, and, and one of the things that Ron enjoyed was watching the growth of all the musicians, and he always contributed all he could to make that happen. I know, Jim did the same thing with me and I am, you know, when I first met him, I was just learning, you know, with my band Dungeon Sounds, you know, playing cover tunes, and, and Ron was always there to support us, you know, get us gigs at the Mission Y, stuff like that, the Shy Fox, the Squeeze In, you know, uh, Renee De La Rosa's club, and we weren't even old enough to get into those clubs yet. The Tropicoro on Broadway. Tropicoro, yeah, on Broadway. Yeah, you know, most of those clubs, but Ron used to get us into those clubs. Well, he had a specialty for getting underage kids in clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he just wanted to see us grow. Yeah, he wanted to expose us to the great music that we were fortunate enough to be around here in the Bay Area. Well, you know, the thing about it, too, is what he's taught me is to do the same what I do with kids here at the house, is to let them grow, give them a place to practice, give them a safe haven. I just took the kid band to High Street Studios to do a three song EP. And you know, like you say, give back to the community. So yep. I kind of picked that up from Ron when they asked me about Ron it just takes me back, man, you know, makes me realize where I came from. And I'll never forget where you come from. And this man is uh, one of the pillars, him and that's the community. He was an advocate yeah, yeah. for he, the kids. He just kept things moving, and yeah, the kids were the priority, and he just loved it, the artistic growth. When also, he you know, worked with a lot of trouble kids. Kids were coming out of juvenile hall. I'm not going to mention the names, no, but, I, but you know, he some worked of them with are kids friends. that were troubled okay. and put them on the right track. Maya! Brother Ron Bermudez had the great privilege of getting a substitution gig at KSOL engineering for one whole month with then radio DJ Sly Stone. And my brother said it was vintage and it was beautiful and he was a joy to work with. I have a lot of memories of Ron. Um, yeah, I was about 13 years old when I started working with him over on San Jose Avenue. Uh, I remember his Volkswagen that he had, uh, but the Musician's Workshop is really a, a beauty for me. It just opened up the world of rock, of Latin rock music that I would play almost every day. I mean, I had one of those old Radio Shack uh, turntable stereos. I'd blast the music, you know, Momotombo, uh, you know, Sapo. Uh, Santana, of course, um, and my mom, you know, she would, she, she'd yell from downstairs, que uh, es el de perro that you're listening to, you know, de perro, you know, dog fight. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was just, just wonderful that, you know, with Ron, he was like a father figure to me, you know, because my father was absent with his own, um, you know, demons and his work that he had to do. Um, so Ron, you know, picked up that slack with it, you know, uh, being a father figure to me, and I really enjoyed it. Um, 
but you know what it really did it just opened me up to the music which I still listen to to this day uh, my kids get tired of me listening to Santana and Mabo <laughs> Uh, but I'll never stop. But it, but it was out of that experience, you know, working with Ron and going to the concerts and the flyers, working on the flyers and um, promoting the um, the events at the California Hall we'd have. It. Um, and I think he had one at Dolores Park, too. Um, but I also remember the show at Everett, um, going down to San Jose, Doobie Brothers, you know, promoting uh, the Latin rock. Yeah. And it's just the, the world of music that opened up for me. That, that is the biggest gift that he provided. And it was such a blessing when I went to go see him and, um, at his home where he's at right now, the, you know, the assisted living. Uh, the first thing he said to me when he saw me walk in, he goes, Musician's Workshop. <laughs> I said, wow, he still has it. <laughs> it was mostly promoting uh, the events that he would put on. You know? La promoción. La promoción, <laughs> And a uh, wonderful time, you know. So again, we'd sell tickets, um, promote, uh, put out flyers, go to different businesses, and, you know, hang them up there. Uh, just, you know, go to door to door sometimes, uh, distributing flyers, um, and then go to the event themselves. The music, the love of music, the different different genres of music that came with it. You know? Like that seca would, you know, it, it, I wasn't a jazz guy. I didn't listen to jazz back then. Why you listen to Azteca? You know they 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 blended jazz with Latin rock. So I, I listen to jazz. You know John Coltrane. You know Santana did the same thing when he. You know my taste evolved along with you know getting exposed with it. But the, the start happened there. So what would you say to Ron if he was standing right here right now? I would thank him for what he did. You know for providing me with the. Um, the love of music and for you know and to let him know that he did I, I I've never told him that that he played up uh, I looked up to him as a, in that father figure role outstanding thank you so much Viva Nicaragua. A la gran puchica. Casa Bandido here on 2050 New York in the heart of the Mission District. So everybody be here September 28th, which is also my birthday. We're going to be doing the unveiling of Pearl and Ron Bermuda's on the mural. Sobrino 